Hello, I'm Terry Kramer, faculty director for the Easton Technology Management Center, and I'd like to welcome you to this second annual program focused on the future of innovation and impact on the MBA education. Now, we're fortunate that we're going to be going through a variety of things tonight, but most importantly, sharing the winners of our two cross-campus innovation challenge team. So basically two teams reading out. Following that, we're gonna have a discussion with our Dean, Tony Bernardo. So specifically for the event, I'm gonna start out just spending a few minutes providing some of the latest technology trends that I hope will contextualize our conversation on technology-based innovation. And then, as I mentioned, we're gonna get a readout from the two winning teams from our cross-campus innovation challenge. And then finally, I'll have a discussion with Dean Tony Bernardo talking about all the changes that are going on externally in the world, including technology-based innovation and the impact on the MBA education. Now, let me just start out with a few trends again to hopefully set the stage for the presentations. Whenever I think about technology-based innovation, I think about four key technologies that act as enablers. The first one is high-speed mobile networks. And today we often think of these as either LTE or 4G, or most recently, fifth generation networks. Fifth generation mobile networks often getting a gigabit per second or more. So eclipsing what we would often experience in our home and office. When you look today in the US, about 75% of the nation's population is now covered with fifth generation uh, networks. More and more people are getting devices that allow that service. When you look abroad at China, as good as the number is in the US, China is eclipsing the US right now by a factor of about 15 to one in terms of the number of sites that enable fifth generation uh, network service. Second major trend, Internet of Things. This is connected devices, connected homes, buildings, wearable devices, cars, et cetera, et cetera. There are now about 21 billion connected devices worldwide. Again, consumer, enterprise, all applications. That number is expected to grow past 75 billion in the next four years by 2025. So huge presence of connected devices. Third area is cloud computing. Cloud computing, this is in the form of company offerings like AWS uh, uh, through Amazon, Azure through Microsoft, Google Cloud. The ability to safely, efficiently, and effectively store and access data. And more and more a discussion about edge computing. So really taking processing and storage closer and closer to the location of where the action is. In the case of an autonomous vehicle, closer to a vehicle itself. The final piece is with all of this data, the ability to analyze and predict, which is probably the most profound area of technology-based innovation. The use of data to predict future activities, future interests, future service. If you look at an example of where the different products and services are that are based on these enabling technologies, I've listed a variety of them here. Autonomous vehicles, especially coupled with ride sharing, may fundamentally change how transportation occurs uh, today. Virtual assistants, so when you think about Siri as an example, the ability with full contextualization on an opt-in basis to understand who you are, where you are, what services you use to create more live dialogue um, with a virtual assistant and huge implications for customer service and sales and interactions with the internet overall. Diagnostic tools and recommendation engines. So whether this be in media with a recommendation engine and service like Netflix or diagnostic tools with healthcare. That ability more and more to predict and recommend has been some of the most interesting areas of innovation. Quint plays, interesting timing of tonight's event. AT&T actually announced today that they were gonna spin off their Time Warner holdings with Discovery and couple them for a broader media play. That still doesn't take anything away from the fact that 
customers more and more want bundled services in many cases, whether those assets are owned or not. The next billion internet users, there are literally 3 billion people in the world that still don't have internet access. And there are more and more low cost solutions, primarily satellite based that allow for low cost internet access. And then COVID has accelerated specifically last mile delivery, contactless technology, security applications again in the last year. Now on that topic, if you look at current events, I want to call out two of them because they have a huge bearing on technology and they have a huge bearing on management and leadership itself. So first of all, when you look at COVID-19, the fundamental idea about place, the place of where we shop, where we're educated, uh, where we're entertained has fundamentally changed where many times now things are occurring in a home and maybe eventually in an office, but primarily in a home that has changed the acceleration, the adoption of technology, whether that be e-commerce, whether that be telehealth solutions, whether that be video conferencing applications, we've seen a discontinuity of adoption. That has affected adoption of technologies. That's also had an effect on many other industries that have had to deal in, in a challenging way with the adoption of technology, whether that be retailers, whether that be in commercial real estate, whether that be in education or whether that be in healthcare, big shifts that have occurred. The second area I wanted to call out is the growing and notable cases of racial inequities. So first of all, looking at the role of technology as an example in the George Floyd case, the ability to have a smartphone create a new level of transparency, of awareness of what actually was happening, the ability of social media to create immediate awareness, lots of positive applications there. But also when you look more broadly, there's more and more concern about the credibility of a variety of our institutions. And whether that be our government, whether that be uh, educational institutions, whether that be businesses, the whole idea about are we leading in the right way? Are we thinking about the full range of stakeholders? And in the case of business, not just thinking about shareholders or even customers, but thinking about employees, thinking about public stakeholders, elected officials, regulators, the electorate, and really saying, are you really leading in a way that's serving all stakeholders? So a growing role of the CEO. So what are the implications of these technology-based innovations? a big shift towards data more and more as an area of innovation. And that data allows prediction, not just past tense analysis, but prediction. More and more focus on interaction with the internet on a voice basis and a video basis, and not just texting and typing. An acceleration of immersive experiences and things like sales and service an acceleration of adoption due to COVID, as I just mentioned, an acceleration of what I would call outsider in disruptions. So as an example in healthcare, moves that players such as Google and Amazon have made in healthcare, and more and more a flight to scale, increasing returns to scale of many data technology-based businesses. With all of this, a bigger focus on public policy implications. So on the quote unquote good side, technology can be used more and more to address societal needs, whether that be in education, whether that be in healthcare, whether that be in transportation, but a growing number of tech lash issues, concerns about data privacy, about antitrust, about misinformation and disinformation on social networks about the future of work and whether jobs will be changed at best or lost at worst. Income divide, global divide, internet governance, et cetera, a whole host of these. And to my previous point, the ability of leaders to say, how do we ensure good outcomes of technology-based innovation and understand the negative externalities and ensure these are being considered as innovation advances? 
So all of this puts together broad leadership implications. Where can technology be good, used for good, for value creation, how to mitigate being disrupted, how to think about new business models. So more and more monetizing in outcome-based models on free models and advertising, et cetera thinking more and more about interdisciplinary innovation. So all the things we're gonna talk about tonight with the assets that we have at UCLA. Thinking about changing competition. Many established players are having to think about being disrupted by large technology companies. And as I mentioned, a growing focus on technology and society and consideration of a tech lash. Now, all of this brings me to our UCLA Cross-Campus Innovation Challenge. Let me start out with what we were seeking to do with this Innovation Challenge. Two primary objectives. Number one is to create new areas of innovation that are interdisciplinary in nature. So can we create new ventures that are really gonna make a big mark on business, on consumers, on society. And as you know, we've picked two areas of focus this year, healthcare and sustainability. The second goal of the Innovation Challenge is to create learnings around the Innovation Challenge. You know, we are at the end of the day an academic institution and we need to be creating a multiplier effect. So what are the learnings that have come from these teams that will empower the next generation of teams so that they can be thinking about effective innovation? What is the role of technology? How do they think about stakeholders, et cetera? As we constructed the Innovation Challenge, several key elements were developed. Number one is we wanted to make sure that we had teams working across campus fully. So we said that all the teams had to have three to five participants, at least one as an MBA and at least one as a non-MBA. And they needed to be, if they're not from Anderson, they needed to be from the School of Medicine, the School of Engineering, the School of Public Policy, the School of Public Health. And you'll see with the teams tonight, these are truly interdisciplinary teams. The second piece here is we had two rounds of evaluation. We had a qualifying review, which was made up of reviewing business plans from all the entering teams, and then selecting a narrow few for a final pitch day. We had a terrific group of subject matter experts that agreed to be advisors to the finalist group. And we ultimately, on the final pitch day, evaluated the teams on four criteria. The first one is impact. So how broad is the impact of what the teams sought out to do? How many people were they seeking to impact? Was it gonna affect society broadly? The second area is feasibility. Is can the great ideas from these teams actually be executed on? So have they been thoughtful about what it takes to execute? What are the milestones? Can they build a team, et cetera, et cetera. Third area is on innovation. Is what they're coming up with truly disruptive? Is it truly creative? Is it really going to move the, the mark in terms of outcomes? And then the final area is persuasion. All of these teams, assuming they advance as ventures, are going to have to persuade others. They're going to have to persuade investors to invest they're gonna to have to persuade customers to try out their services. They're gonna to have to persuade partners to partner with them. That ability to persuade is an important uh, uh, trait. Now, as I mentioned, we had two tracks. The first one is on sustainability. So the prompt on the sustainability track was to reduce or offset the carbon footprint at scale emitted from industrial operations, commercial buildings, homes, multifamily dwellings, electricity production, et cetera. So a fairly broad prompt, all oriented around offsetting the carbon footprint. We had three teams enter. They presented in a, in a, a final uh, pitch in front of four judges. That was on April 23rd. And that was for a first place prize of $10,000. I want to call out our partners on this, the Institute of Carbon Management at UCLA and the UCLA Sustainable LA Grand Challenge. Very important partners, again, in getting this cross-campus partnership uh, working. We had several judges 
Um, Angelina, David, and Paul, I would just call out, were industry experts, either as entrepreneurs, as leaders of large organizations, as investors, so they could really help evaluate effectively. The three teams that we had in the sustainability track included Bluefin Foods, who you're going to hear from tonight. They're focused on a cell-based tuna solution. We also had Lysis, another excellent team, focus on renewable energy sources and storage. And then finally, another great team, Cavendish. They were focused on lithium production and development, primarily for electric vehicles. All three teams were terrific. Second track that we had was on healthcare. The prompt that was given on the healthcare track is to use technology to create a solution that will significantly improve accessibility, affordability, health outcomes, or care delivery in US healthcare. We had 17 teams enter that competition, six finalist teams presented in front of four judges on April 30th. And there were three prizes there, $25,000 for first place, 15,000 for second, 10,000 for third. Our partnership there was with UCLA Health, another critical partner of ours to ensure the synergistic effect with the teams uh, that entered. We again had great judges there that had domain expertise, again, as investors, as operators of large organizations and as investors. The teams that made it to the final round for healthcare are sh uh, shown here on the screen. Sonify had a point of care ultrasound solution. Humane had an AI solution for hospital applications. Safer Ventilator had a personalized lung therapy solution. Fig Therapeutics had a biomaterial based vaccine booster initially targeted for COVID. Ananet, who's gonna to present tonight, a synthetic patient data solution, and then Rise.Care, a data-driven solution for family caregivers enabling remote healthcare. Again, great teams working across uh, campus. So now we're gonna have presentations from our two uh, winning teams. First from Bluefin Foods, then from Anonet. We're gonna provide five minutes for each team and then we will go to a Q&A session. As a reminder, if you'd like to submit questions, go to slido.com and you can enter in the event code innovation1, innovation1, and that will uh, allow you to send in a question. I'll, enable, I'll uh, endeavor to ask the most popular questions after a couple that I will tee up initially. So welcome to uh, Bluefin Foods and we will uh, turn it over to you. Okay, thanks so much. Let me share my screen and start the slideshow. Okay, hopefully you guys are looking at the big screen. Okay, uh, hello everyone. We are Bluefin Foods and I am here to tell you that we have a problem. So as a species, we are literally outgrowing our ability to feed ourselves. Uh, by 2050, we're going to have 24% more people and global meat consumption is going to go up by 88%. If everyone ate meat like the way we do in the US, we can only feed one out of four people in the world. So uh, basically livestock farming and com commercial fishing is stretched to the limit today. It, so it's, it cannot scale and it's not sustainable. So what is the solution? Cell cultured meat. So of all alternative methods for traditional meat, as we know from a slaughtered animal, cell cultured meat is the best. You can see here that it has the highest meat similarity and also the highest commercial potential. So it's really hitting that sweet spot. But before we go any further real quick, let me just describe briefly what cell cultured meat is. So cell cultured meat, you have the ability to create large amounts of meat food products from a single animal that does not even uh, result in the death of the animal. So basically you take a biopsy, uh, in this case of a tuna, and then you isolate these stem cells, you combine that with a bioreactor and growth media to give it the environment that these cells need to replicate and differentiate. And then through a texturing process, you create these uh, food products that everyone knows and loves from the cells that you have grown and proliferated. So 
we need cell cultured meat and market analysts know this as well. So we can see that the cell culture meat is projected to have significant growth. Um, I just wanna call out two things here. First is that in nine years, so not even a decade, this is supposed to be 10%, which is a $140 billion industry uh, for cell cultured meat. And also I like that uh, the story this slide tells where you can see cell cultured meat takes significant market share over from uh, conventional meat specifically. So this is really huge in showing that cell culture meat is the future and it's really going to be the answer for a sustainable and a more effective solution to feeding the planet. So not only is cell cultured meat a big market, but it's just plain better. So a, a few advantages that cell culture meat has is that it's healthier, right? Because you're growing these cells from the ground up, if you will, uh, there's no such thing as microplastics or mercury or antibiotics in the case of uh, aquaculture. Uh, there's a huge antibiotics problem. So it's healthier. It's more humane, right? Like I said, you can create large amounts of meats without the death of a single animal. And it's more sustainable. Obviously, this is a big one, especially for the competition. So these huge commercial fishing fleets are incredibly damaging to both the ecosystem and also to these uh, marine wildlife populations. So you can imagine that a, a much simpler and much smaller supply chain will result in much less carbon emissions. You don't need all those fleets of fishing boats when you can just create it all in your lab. And then last but not least, uh, flexible production. So uh, you can imagine there's a lot of different levers and dials you can turn with producing uh, this cell cultured meat so that uh, you can reduce waste and also you have increased flexibility of sales. So through our research, we found that the best place to start is, you may have guessed it from the name, Pacific Bluefin Tuna. So we love Bluefin Tuna because of three main reasons. Uh, the first is high demand, right? So you can see that there's been 122% increase in fish consumption uh, from 1990 to 2018. Also, tuna is used in 80% of sushi. Uh, the second is high scarcity, and this is a big one, right? Uh, Pacific blue bluefin tuna is horribly overfished and it's currently at its uh, at 2.6 percent of its historical population and it's still being overfished so there's a very real possibility that they will be extinct soon and then last but not least of course as the economics go you can't be a business without uh, having a product that people are willing to buy uh, premium price so uh, bluefin tuna goes from anywhere from 40 to 200 dollars per pound so you're really seeing the uh, market and that willingness to pay there so these are three really good reasons why we've identified Pacific Bluefin Tuna. But the main thing is you can use this on any meat. And to go back to what I said in the beginning, the uh, commercial livestock and commercial fishing, all these factory farms, it's, it's not sustainable, nor is it scalable. And so cell cultured meat really is the solution and it's the way forward as a species. Thanks for your time. Excellent. We'll switch over to Anna next. All right. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Sean. I'm here representing our company, Anna And I just want to give a big thank you to everyone who made this innovation challenge possible. So I wanted to start off by asking the audience a question. How would you feel if someone else looked through your medical history, your blood work, the medications you take, your private health data? I imagine that this is probably uncomfortable for most of us here to think about. I mean, your data is yours and belongs to no one else, especially not Google, who in 2019 bought the medical data of 50 million people. There are likely people in this very audience whose medical data has been viewed by some unknown Google engineer out there. And as disturbing as this is though, this is a two-sided coin. Your medical data has the potential to save people's lives. No exaggeration, healthcare researchers use medical data to rapidly test their hypotheses about different diseases. Hospitals use it to develop artificial intelligence that diagnoses cancer better than their human doctor counterparts. More access to medical data means more innovation in healthcare. So what the world needs is a way to share medical data without compromising on patient privacy. Today, the best the US healthcare system has to offer is to remove major identifiers, like they'll remove your name, your date of birth, your geographic location. 
And though this de-identification removes really is seems effective, it removes really useful information, and it actually fails to properly hide your your identity. Researchers have shown you can use it to reverse engineer people's identity. So this doesn't work. And a good solution has to provide all of the useful information while still protecting patient privacy. To do this, our company, Analnet, is working on a platform to generate synthetic patient data. Synthetic data is non-reversible, artificially created data that has the same statistics and correlations of real world raw data. The patient data seems real, but those patients don't actually exist. So instead of sharing real medical data, we can share synthetic medical data in its place. And synthetic data has strong privacy guarantees coming from mathematics, known as differential privacy. Privacy measures so strong that the US government uses it to anonymize census data. So when you share synthetic data, you can feel fully confident that no one can reverse engineer your identity. So not only does synthetic data contain the same information that raw data has, but it also fully protects patient privacy. And what insight could you gain from synthetic data? Pretty much most things that raw data will give you. The CDC could use it to simulate vaccine effectiveness in patient populations. Cancer researchers could use synthetic data to explore the correlations between cancer and fine-grained patient demographics. Machine learning engineers could use it to develop advanced AI models to provide diagnoses and medical recommendations. I mean, the applications are, very, are really boundless. Analnet synthetic data benefits everyone in the medical data ecosystem. Medical data users like researchers or insurance companies can use synthetic data to gain insight into the problems they're working on. And meanwhile, medical data owners like research hospitals or pharma can monetize their patient data in a manner that is profitable, all while respecting the ethics of patient privacy. And because synthetic patient data isn't real people's data, there's no need for the months of negotiation and extensive data use agreements that you have to sign for real data. Synthetic data truly is an accelerant for medical data exchange and innovation. We are a team of students and entrepreneurs representing the joint efforts of UCLA Anderson, UCLA Computer Science, and UCLA Health. Our backgrounds include deep learning, software engineering, marketing, product management, and finance. We believe that our team consists of the right people needed to turn this company from conception to reality. Thank you very much. Excellent, great job to, to both teams. And let me do this, let me start out with a couple of questions myself and then I'm gonna to go to Slido uh, uh, for uh, some of the audience questions. So listen, both of you, have, uh, both teams have explained how you came up with your idea. Let me ask you the next phase, I assume it's the next phase, which is how did you assemble a team to decide, you know, uh, how are you going to advance this? So let me start with Bluefin. How did you guys come together as a group? How did you do the, the pairing? How did you meet people from other schools? So yeah. our, our team was assembled uh, starting very early on within our executive MBA program. Uh, there were multiple classes that we had to start with and form a team and then come up with a general business idea. And just through going and networking and talking with classmates, we found a group of individuals who had skill sets that complemented each other. There was very little overlap within our skill sets and the formation of the team really kind of centered around picking people out who could come together and work on a big idea just like this and bring it to fruition. Now, when we came to uh, the innovation challenge, we actually uh, had an entrepreneurship and biotechnology class where we ran across some students from other areas of UCLA. And uh, eventually what's come about from this is that we were able to bring these scientists in uh, to help our team work on this challenge. And then uh, since then, and since the innovation challenge, we've hired them on as uh, two of our first individuals uh, or individual hires for Bluefin Foods. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent, very helpful. Uh, Sean, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so 
for building a team, it's, it's actually was a really long process. Um, I know this is the second year of the innovation challenge, but I actually did, did this challenge last year as well. And I actually met one of our members, Mary through that, um, you know, team building is kind of tough. Uh, it, it's a long process. You have to find people who, um, kind of share the same passion with you as well. Um, and I, I don't think I can claim that I know the full answers yet. I think it's still a learning process. Good. It, let me ask you a little bit more on that though, Sean. So Andrew said basically one of the ways to kind of form a team is by these classes where you meet people from other schools at UCLA. Is that kind of your way that it worked for you or were there other ways that you found people cross campus? Yeah, I mean, I think the business, the, these business case competitions are really the main way of meeting people. Um, I met a lot of people through computer science, but you know, since I started this venture, COVID hit and it was very hard to meet people in class. So in a, in a COVID world, in a, in a virtual world, it, it was very difficult to network, um, to network people in a class when you're just sitting there watching a lecture on Zoom. Um, but doing these business case competitions, we actually meet other people and actually start um, f- forming teams. And I think that was the best way for us personally. Good, Sean, one follow on on that, being a technology guy myself, you know, when you say, you know, you can't do this in a virtual environment, I would have thought actually in an online environment, you have a better ability to match people because you have broader sample set, you can, you know, whether it's like a dating app, you can kind of pick people out specifically. Do you buy that argument or, or no? Uh, it's a tough one. Um, I, I, see, I see your argument to that. Um, it, I think that it's, it can be tough, at least in a computer science setting, like, like in a classroom setting, for example, it's, it's tough to, um, to meet other people. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Good. No, no, no issue at all. Bluefin, let me go to you guys on this. In terms of your biggest learnings from the project itself and what you're building, what would have been the biggest learnings uh, you guys have uh, experienced? Yeah, so I can say that uh, for me, it's just been the technical depth of this area and this industry, especially. So, you know, we knew what we were getting into, if you will, when we started looking into this. But as we did more and more primary and secondary research, uh, we realized how technically complex this field is. And that was challenging for us because we're a team of five executive MBAs. So, uh, once we really connected to these students through, you know, these joint classes like Drew was talking about, and also through uh, connections from professors that we would speak to in interview, they'd be like, oh, you should talk to this person. Uh, that's how we got actually referred to another hire we made is uh, from a professor that she introduced us to a, a student interested in the space, a PhD student. Um, but basically, long story short, yeah, I think just the technical depth of it and knowing that um, you have to find that expertise that is willing to help you out and be on the team to really be able to dive into that and do things that we couldn't. Excellent. Excellent. Let me uh, start posing some questions that came from the audience that are much more specific on the offerings. And Bluefin team, let me start with you. A couple of questions. First of all, how is the offering you have here different from other cultured seafood companies that have received funding? So our company kind of differentiates ourselves in a number of different ways. Uh, First off, this industry is broken down into multiple different sectors. There's poultry, there's chicken, uh, there's fish. Now, the majority of the competition out there, if you could call them that, is looking at at, at poultry, is looking at pork, is looking at uh, beef products. There's relatively few companies looking at uh, developing fish products. Now, the ones that are out there have taken a lot of uh, the science and a lot of uh, their techniques from the biopharma space. And they're trying to incorporate a lot of uh, the techniques used in developing drugs. Through our research, we found out that maybe some of these ways that they're going about trying to do this is it's possible to use those techniques, but there may be better techniques to achieving this through maybe a little bit different pathway. And that's what our team is doing. We're kind of starting from the ground up. We're working with companies who are developing biotech 
or bioreactors. We're working uh, or trying to partner with companies to create a growth serum or it's the solution which provides the nutrients for the cells to grow. We're going to be doing that from the ground up. And some of these other companies and competition out there um, are, they're doing it, but they're taking uh, what's occurred in biopharma and trying to force a square peg into a round hole, so to speak. Good. One other uh, question for you guys here is um, from the audience. How do you overcome the objection of lab grown meat from the, uh, for the general population? Um, that uh, we actually um, uh, conducted quite a few uh, research in this area. Um, the uh, custom acceptance is really important to us because this is a new technology and it's going to be a new product. Uh, based on our research, we find out that uh, uh, the Gen Z uh, specifically is uh, really um, 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 willing to try new things. And uh, uh, among those, uh, the cell based uh, the meats uh, not only have all the benefits that the Keith just mentioned uh, during the presentation, they really uh, uh, grape on the, the idea of the uh, sensibility of the meat and how clean and how safe that is. Mm -hmm. And then the other uh, study we have conducted actually, um, and the reference to a, a research survey just uh, um, um, performed by a, a known, um, well-known uh, institute is that 60% uh, of the vegan, in fact, are willing to try uh, cell-based meat once it's not uh, um, uh, taken uh, directly from the ocean or uh, from the farm. So we we believe that, that this is how the uh, new customer are going to come up with the with the market and uh, that this product uh, going to be uh, fulfill the needs of uh, target these uh, customers. Excellent. Very very helpful. Sean, let me go back over uh, to you and your your team here. Series of questions on your offering here. Um, first one's from Scott Cooper, one of our alumni. Um, if it's not real people's data, how do you know that the outputs, the outcomes and the inputs are valid and don't provide false uh, outcomes? Yeah, so there's a, this is a, I, I guess I don't want to go too much into the technical aspect of this, but really there's a series of statistical tests that you can run against the synthetic data to ensure that um, the statistics of the synthetic data matches the statistics of the real data. Um, at, at a high level, that's basic, basically like our, we're designing an AI algorithm to look at real data and look at synthetic data that we generate. And our training pr procedure is basically, can our AI tell the difference between the two? Mm -hmm. um, and at the point where the AI no longer has the ability to do that is when we know we've converged. And then we can validate that with a series of statistical tests that show that the correlations between different columns in our data still are consistent. Good. What is that? If we can, I don't know if it's public or not, but what is the yeah. correlation or matching? Are you near 100% matching? Is it 50%? Is it something else? Uh, sorry, could, could you clarify? That representative nature of the synthetic data to real data, like how close are you quantitatively? I see. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's different ways to quantify that. Um, there's like things like spearmint correlations, there's stuff like where you have a heat map of correlations that you can visualize. Um, it's, I think that this is like state of the art cutting edge technology right now. Um, and so it's hard to say exactly um, what level of precision we have. It's gonna get better and better with time. Uh, if you've ever heard of a deep fake before, it's actually the same technology underpinning deep fakes. So deep fakes are getting better and better, which is making our technology better and better. So, so really it's something that's gonna get better with time. Excellent. Excellent. Let me go back over to Bluefin. A uh, couple other questions um, here. Um, a lot of it has to do with the emerging markets and markets where the willingness to pay may be lower. How do you think about that market? And does your business model in essence still work at what might be lower price points? Yeah. yeah so, so go ahead, Keith. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Drew. Uh, yeah, and this kind of, I was just going to say, this kind of hits on what Drew was saying beforehand. Um, but we believe, so right now there's about a 12 times cost difference, right? So cell cultured meat as of right now is about 12 times as expensive as the fish or the beef you're going to go buy in the grocery store. 
And that's the problem to solve. So the technology isn't the issue. We've been doing cell cultures in the lab for 50 years plus. So really the problem to solve here is the engineering and scaling of this very complex and inefficient costly process to a very, a very large level where you get you know, economies of learning, economies of scale, things like that. So the, uh, we actually have seen from research and secondary market research and analysis and all that is that uh, everything points to there may be a higher consumer willingness to pay because of the sustainability aspects. You know, it's better for the environment, it's better for the species, and also it's cleaner, right? It's better for us, it's more healthy. Uh, however, we know that's not gonna get us all the way. So the name of the game is uh, really uh, raising that willingness to pay through marketing and co-branding um, ads and really leaning into that sustainability aspect of it. And then also using these um, magnitudes of scale in order to bring that production cost down. Does that leave you basically, quote unquote, stuck at a higher price point or a, a smaller portion of the population that can pay? Or is there some strategy to kind of get to a lower cost position and open up the market? Yeah, absolutely. We definitely want to open up the market. And the long-term vision is that we're creating all kinds of meat for everyone, literally the world. So, you know, that's the level of scale we're hoping to accomplish here is that our costs are lower. Because if you think if we can get to the point where the costs are lower, then we have a better product at lower cost. So now we're really talking about putting commercial fishing industries out of business, right? So if we have something better that's uh, less expensive, it's just a no-brainer. So uh, that is the goal. However, of course, that's, that's pretty far away at this point. And again, see the, the 12 times cost right now today. So that's the problem to solve. Excellent. One last question for you guys. Um, if it's public, where else have you gotten funding? So we have uh, received funding from uh, competitions like this, of course. And we are in the middle of our pre-seed round and we have some angels we're talking to right now. We also just recently got notified that um, the National Science Foundation uh, small business loan, we got accepted to that. And so uh, there's obviously more process, but that starts off with 250,000 and goes all the way up to 2.5 million. And um, that's really awesome because one of our strategies is to embrace non-dilutive funding as much as possible. But Again, the short answer to your question is uh, right now it's uh, pre-seed, angels, friends and family, competitions, um, government non-dilutive funding, but we know we're going to need VCs because of our scale and, what we're, and our scope, we're going to need that VC money. Excellent. Let me ask a final question to both groups. And Sean, I'll start with you and, uh, and your team, but same question for both. And that is, what advice would you give to your classmates if they're interested in technology-based entrepreneurship, participating in a program like this? What advice would you give them? I can, I can take that. Oh, sorry. Oh. You can go. Thank you. Uh, so, Personally, what I realized is that uh, if you have an idea and uh, you feel like it's possible, um, it might initially feel like there's going to be a lot of smarter people with a lot of bigger money and uh, investment and, uh, and much bigger corporations that they should be the people tackling it. But you never know where the, the source of the next big idea is going to come from and all these big companies were once just uh, a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, in, a, in a garage um, just just trying out their idea so just take a chance at it um, you won't know if your idea was this was the main solution to the problem you're interested in without uh, trying it out first yep Parham, when did you, if it's not too personal a question, when did you personally start getting confidence that this thing is pretty interesting that you're working on and it's going to do okay? Um, so this was back in January, I would say, uh, early January or when I met, I, I first met uh, Sean and uh, it, it required, like initially over the phone call, you know, there's going to be some skepticism, not understanding the product, um, not clearing it up enough in my own head, but then, you know, through research, and seeing that the, the space is pretty uh, still, you know, we're not the first movers in this space, but it's still relatively early and there's a lot of potential. And as Sean said, technology is only getting better. We're currently literally at the peak of AI. Uh, so uh, we're 
pretty much trying to push the boundaries of this. And, you know, throughout the next 10 years, uh, I, I noticed a, a huge potential for synthet synthetic data, not necessarily only in healthcare, but in a, in a much broader sense in, in across many different industries. So I, I definitely uh, connected with Sean and the rest of the team and uh, hopped on board. Excellent, excellent. Mary, did you have something to add? Yes, I think that there's an, to, to answer your question, Professor Kramer, I think the, the two most important, I mean, probably the most important thing about uh, succeeding the start, startup and also entrepreneur world is actually uh, to make the team instead of the idea in my perspective. The idea is extremely important, technology too, but um, there are many that have failed because of the team mix. Um, so I think that the most important part is to be, um, to be able to not only see the unique skill sets that the teammate, the, the, each of the team, mer team member has brought in, but also the personality fix, um, per personality mix, and um, the uh, willingness to learn new skills and cover each other's track and being able to wear multiple hats. Uh, over, we, we started this project back in January and it's already uh, mid-May. And throughout the, throughout the journey, um, I believe that me and also the rest of the team have learned so much more than what they came, what we came in with. And that is one of the, and being able to um, step out of our comfort zone. And that was probably one of the biggest contribution of, um, of the success that we have then today. And I think the other thing that to, to consider is that um, being able to get the, the names out of there and the, uh, the team name out of there, being able to get the idea out of there, and that requires participations of um, different kinds of challenges, competition incubator program. Uh, me and Sean were in the accelerator program initially, and that's how we were able to develop the initial stage. And then along the way, more team mem talented team member arrived and we were able to push through. And there were so many people that we want to thank for and uh, that have contributed to the idea and where we are. Um, that that are not here and it's it's just a much bigger it's it's just snowballs and it's a much bigger um, collaboration than what people think would be oh just you know maybe two or three guys and they they you know working on their own it's it's the networking the school the challenges professors and mentors advisors Excellent. Well, uh, well said. By the way, your point about the team, even more than the idea, one of the people that I have speak in my class, Barry Eggers, he's a founding partner of Lightspeed Ventures, very big early stage VC. He says the same exact thing that you do. They look at the team for the talent, the agility, the ability to pivot and work with one another more than even the idea itself. Uh, because they say talented people will work them, their, themselves through any challenge. So you've, uh, you've obviously uh, validated that. So thank you for your, uh, your comments. Let me go to the Bluefin uh, team. Your advice for other uh, classmates. I'll just say, take the first step, you know, don't be scared of actually doing something that it seems that it's impossible or it seems that it's hard. We were, when this first idea came along, it was for the entrepreneurship venture initiation class. And we had several of ideas from simple ideas like creating balloon solutions to sell culture meat. And we decided to go to the hardest one because we knew that the group of people, the t first of all, the time was right there. We're all in this program because we wanted to do something great. And we all had already been vetted and we knew that we were a group of smart people trying to do something that together we would be able to achieve, perhaps not individually, but together we would be able to achieve that. And then, you know, like the third and I think honestly the most important one for our team is that each one of us have a different set of skills and we listen to each other. We're, we don't never take anything to, you know, offensive it doesn't hurt our egos because we don't have the answers to everything. We know that we're all here learning and trying to be better. And we know that there's a lot of information that it's even from outside of our industry because our industry is just getting started. So being curious, actually, you know, listening and taking the steps necessary to make sure that you can grow and develop. I honestly believe, uh, it's one of our strongs, uh, strongest suited for Bluefin Foods. 
Excellent. Startups Excellent. are hard. I mean, um, you know, Professor Kimmer, I started my career in a startup and, you know, no job is too big or too small. So you just got to jump in where you feel the team might be struggling. So I think that's really important in being successful and, and aligning yourself to the purpose. So if you're passionate about that idea and you really are mission oriented towards that, I think that's the key to making your business successful. Wow. Excellent message. I can't think of a better way to finish up this section just to hear both teams kind of focus on the team, the tenacity, the ability to partner, the ability to deal with adversity more than the intrinsic idea itself. And I think that's a real commendation on all of you and how you look at life and, and solving big problems. So let me just say congratulations to both of the teams. You guys came up with with projects that are fundamentally gonna solve big problems. You did it in a way that represents UCLA so well and came away with a lot of learnings that will help the next generation of students in this. So big congratulations. I hope you'll stay with us for the rest of the event tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing uh, your next chapter and where you go with, uh, with your ventures. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Terry. Thank you so much. You Thank bet. You. And we're going to shift over to Tony, our Dean, Tony Bernardo, who's going to join us here to talk about all of this interesting set of developments in terms of implications for the MBA. And I first have to start with just a little bit for those of you that haven't met Tony and had the magic of Tony. Um, he is a great human being. He is a great scholar. He is a great Dean. Um, he's been with the school for more than 25 years. Um, he's in our finance uh, unit and does a lot of research. Historically, he's done a lot of research on corporate finance in a lot of different areas. He's looked at uh, a lot of finance issues in relation to healthcare models, business models, compensation. He's looked at distressed assets and models there. He's done a broad base of work, again, all in this kind of area of corporate finance. He was appointed in his role in 2019 as the Dean of the school and literally just a few months before COVID uh, hit. I'm sure that's gonna be his legacy and, uh, and a very, uh, very good one. But Tony, let me just start out with, uh, with a big welcome to you. Thanks, Terry. So Tony, I, I got to start out, obviously, we're going to talk about the magic of the cross campus work that we just, you know, evidenced here. But let me just start out on your first two years in the role, you're almost two years into it, COVID hit a few months into it. As you look back on the last two years, give us your experience. And one extreme is, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. <laughs> the other one is, you know what, a lot of good learnings and we're going to get through and all that. Tell us what your, your kind of uh, reflection is on it. Uh, well, yeah. Um, you know, it, it may take a few years for me to be removed from it, to reflect uh, when you're right in the middle of it. It's, there isn't a lot of time for reflection. It's not what I expected, obviously. Uh, but I, you know, I think my the overarching feeling is one of pride. I think more than anything in the community, um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, we had to change pretty much everything we do uh, in in a very short period of time. You know, when we first when we first learned we were going to be going fully remote last spring, we had we had two weeks to prepare for that. And, and the effort that that took uh, from our staff and faculty to make that pivot. And then, uh, you know, obviously a lot of glitches, uh, a lot of mistakes, but we, you know, we were in regular contact with student leaders and getting feedback and trying to incorporate that feedback to, you know, make the best educational experience we could. And I think given the challenges, I'm really extraordinarily proud, but also the way uh, the community uh, came to, um, to, to the aid of um, the most vulnerable among us. You know, soon after the pandemic hit, we had a group of faculty who specialize in operations, supply chain, logistics. They recognized, for example, that UCLA Health was going to have a lot of issues around that, having to deal with, uh, you know, a rise of uh, really a fundamental change in the, the patients that they were going to serve. And they reached out to that uh, UCLA Health to provide their help. Our students uh, did a number of, of, of um, activities to procure 
you know, uh, PPE, uh, other important um, other important things that the UCLA health system and the broader community would need. So, you know, all things considered, yeah, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, um, this has been an extraordinarily challenging time, but watching us collectively meet those challenges, I, I think my, my overarching sentiment is one of pride. And so Tony, if you look back at when you first started the role almost two years ago, and you look at kind of this 15 months where we were in kind of lockdown mode. Do you look at this in terms of your priorities and saying this has been kind of a time shift delay of a year and a few months? Or do you say, no, actually, this kind of gave me a new awareness of what's in the art of the possible and the assets that we have. And this actually isn't delaying anything in terms of the priorities you've got for the school. So, you know, um, when I took over as dean, I wanted to engage pretty quickly in a strategic planning process. And uh, when the co- when when the COVID crisis really you know accelerated, I knew that it was going to take a huge effort just to meet the day to day challenges. And and I really thought carefully about whether or not it made sense to uh, embark on a strategic planning process at that time. But then after thinking about it and talking with many people, I thought there was no better time to do it because COVID directly and indirectly was going to fundamentally change the way we were going to do things going forward. Uh, And if we delayed the strategic planning process, which may have made sense given all of the hard work that we were doing just, uh, uh, you know, to, to conduct our programs and other activities at the same time, I felt if we waited, um, you know, the world might pass us by. And when I say that it was going to fundamentally, you know, change the way we do things, I think there's two different levels at which that was going to happen. One is it made clear that technology was going to play a much more important role in the future of learning and the future of work. Um, And now when you think about the future of work, that has two more implications. How do we conduct the school, the work that happens at the school, and how do we train leaders who are going to be leaders of workplaces and they need to be trained for those changes as well. And then secondarily, it was pretty clear, I think pretty early that, um, you know, and this is is something we learned in numerous conversations with business leaders, COVID accelerated trends that were already in place uh, 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 in many, many different industries. So think of telehealth, for example, uh, you know, there was that that was bubbling, but that just took off in the last year. If you think about and you 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 mentioned many of them, the whole notion of, of place, um, you know, that that was something that was uh, that was moving forward in a in a at a pre, in a pretty robust way. Well, now it's 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 accelerating in almost every dimension of our life. So, if you know, I think it was pretty clear that uh, every aspect of how we conduct our activities at Anderson, but also how we train future leaders was going to change. And so I'm very happy that we went forward with the strategic planning process. And I, I think the implications of, you know, all of all that's gone on the last 15 months are, are, are going to take a long time to under, to understand. I think some of them are clear, but some of them are not yet so clear, but we, we need to be focused on those changes because otherwise we'll be left behind. Yeah. And so Tony, let me drill down on that. And by the way, for those of you who have questions, Innovation 2 on Slido, just enter your questions in slido.com, Innovation 2, the number two is the event code. Tony, let me drill down on these things. So there's several things that are kind of uh, changing in the world around us. Obviously, COVID, pandemics, maybe you expand it to eventually it's going to be climate change. There are broad kind of global issues that are going on. There's another set of issues that are happening that is looking at the credibility of our institutions. And are they run well? And they kind of getting buy-in? Are they getting effectiveness, et cetera? Um, There are issues about inclusion and our organizations being run in an inclusive way. If you look at international issues, what happens in China and India, et cetera, um, if you kind of put all of these together, how do you look at these affecting the curriculum, the mission of the school, what you know success might look like? Uh, there's a lot there. Uh, I think one, okay, so um, I think there's a few uh, overarching thoughts that became, uh, that crystallized. One is, and 
One is, is that for the most vexing problems that we face as a society, it's hard to imagine that business isn't going to play a big role in, in, in the solution, whether it's uh, climate, uh, the provision of health care. Um, you know, if you think about the biggest challenges we face, a business is going to have to play a huge role um, for many reasons. But one you also alluded to, which is, uh, you know, a, there's a, a lack of trust in some of our, our other institutions uh, to meet those challenges. But it's hard to imagine that business isn't going to play a role in meeting those cha challenges. And, you know, it, 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 some of the ones that I mentioned, uh, inequality, you mentioned racial injustices. Business is going to have to play a huge role in uh in in uh, in those societal issues that gets to another now set of imperatives for leaders and that is what is the role of the business and the business leader in society we we had a very narrow view for many many years it's kind of a milton friedman uh derived view that the principle and purpose of a of a business is to um to create uh value for shareholders um but if you think about the myriad com complexities of business today uh, I think that's a, a very narrow view of the role of business. Um, it's a bit of a digression, but but Friedman had in mind uh, the reversibility of decisions made by firms. Uh, subsequently, uh, the decisions that are made by firms, whether it's in gene editing or uh, uh, misinformation in social media or uh, data privacy, are hard to reverse and had to and have to be thought through carefully. So the the leader's role in society is being fundamentally rethought and 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 all of these uh, bus uh, business leaders uh, and and various organizations have to their resources have to be marshaled to solve these huge problems and um, it, it was wonderful to see these student groups tackling two huge problems um, uh, you know one the trade-off between data privacy and the potential health benefits of 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 uh, of data, of, of large scale data and, and uh, deep learning. And, uh, you know, obviously the sustainability of our food, of our food supply. I mean, it's hard to think of two bigger problems, but you can see that this kind of innovation is, is got to be at the, at, at the forefront of solving these problems. So I think another thing that COVID crystallized is just how important the role of, of, of business is going to be in solving these big problems. And then well, then the implications for curriculum uh, and uh, how we how we train leaders for a world like that uh, become quite profound. Mm -hmm. How do you on that topic, Tony, how do you do this? So this shift from the Milton Friedman, by the way, when I went to business school, that was kind of more the dominant yeah. shareholder value. And you kind of climbed the ladder and you thought about, you know, wealth creation and a variety of things. This is a pretty notable shift. One that has not occurred in how I'm, however many years of an MBA education. Um, what does this entail? How profound is the change? And how do you actually change it? Is it curriculum? Is it something more than the curriculum? Is it get into issues of values? Does it get into other issues about who are the stakeholders of the school itself? Tell us a little bit more about how profound the change is and how do you actually execute on it? Yeah, I mean, the, the change is pretty profound. I mean, uh, let me give a narrow example. I'm a professor of finance. And if you think about the classic way of evaluating investment projects in finance, it's NPV analysis, where all the analysis is done on the financials, right? So we, we manipulate financials to get cash flows. Then we ask, what's the appropriate rate of return for our investors? And if it's positive NPV, it's good. And if it's negative NPV, it's not bad. There isn't even one piece of that analysis that involves anything other than the shareholders. And many of those decisions have, have broad societal impacts. And so, uh, you know, if you take something even as fundamental as investment analysis, uh, then um, uh, that has, uh, the, the fundamental framework has to be changed. Then the, the things you have to measure have to be changed. Because now, you know, to evaluate an investment project, all you need to know is the cash flow that it generates. But if there's all these environmental impacts, for example, how do we measure them? Which are the ones that are the most important? And then how do you balance them uh, against the financial rewards? Well, I mean, honestly, I mean, if you just think about that simple decision, you can't, you know, you, now you're, you're you, almost every aspect of that decision is, is changed fundamentally. The frameworks that you would use, the data that you would need to gather, and then this ethical or a principle of judgment that you have to make 
about how to weigh those different factors. Whereas we made it easy for you. We just said, maximize one thing. Well, try maximizing multiple things across, you know, where there's some arbitrary weights that depend on our values. And by the way, you mentioned something interesting earlier. You know, you said there's an international perspective. And what's interesting is from a societal point of view, different societies weigh those different objectives differently. So the way we might come to that conclusion uh, in, in, in one society might be actually quite different than how they come to conclusions in a different society. So, you know, if you take data privacy, the, the trade-off in Europe is very different than the trade-off in, in, say, parts of Asia and very different than the trade-off in, in the U.S. Well, that now has implications for the opportunities that are available in different parts of the world. So you can see when you change that one thing, it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like you've changed a lot, but you've changed everything. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, the implications uh, for curriculum are vast, for, for data gathering are vast, but then because we've introduced multiple objectives, you've now introduced a weighting across them. And, 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 uh, uh, and then you get into deep issues of, of, of principles and purpose and, and, and uh, many domains open up. Yeah, so how do you do this now? Now the what we've kind of talked about, which is profound and very aspirational, how do you actually make this happen? Do, is there going to be a shift in the research activities of the school? Is, uh, are the materials and the content available today? Is the format under which we would you know, teach different? Give us kind of the, the hows that you think of early on here. Well, if you think, so if you think about all the challenges, uh, universities are uniquely able to meet those challenges because it involves research. Um, the, many of the issues I've raised are, are nascent issues that haven't been well-researched. There's, uh, uh, there's the teaching component. There's, uh, and then as a great public university, this is, this is very much consistent with our public mission. So if you think about the scope of all of these activities, they align quite well with our, our, our underlying missions at UCLA. And then I'll say one other thing, which is in, indicated by uh, you know, the groups that we heard from and all the groups that participated. These problems are fundamentally cross-disciplinary. I mean, if you think about all the issues that I raised, there are ethical issues, there are legal issues, there are issues that involve scientific gathering of information, there are issues having to do with public policy and regulation and disclosure rules, and then there are, you know, the traditional uh, techniques that we use in management. So if you were to ask me to make another prediction um, about how we conduct programs going forward, they'll be fundamentally more cross-disciplinary than they are now. We yeah. will be drawing on expertise across the campus much more uh, to tackle these issues than, than what we can provide as a management school. Uh, um, you know, and, and uh uh, so there, you know, all we have to move forward on on all these dimensions. I think there's extraordinary um, uh, research implications uh, of 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 these changes, and um, and and we talk pedagogically. But one thing that excites me about all this is that we're move that it, that it is very consistent with our public mission that um, um, that we we are doing all this work in service to society. Yeah. Tony, how on, on that, you heard the question I asked uh, Sean uh, about, you know, how he found team members at Anonet and all that. And as a technology person, I, I, I kind of cringed a little bit with this random human kind of you meet people and this and that. In the world of data and matching and platform based businesses and all that, you like to think there's a little bit more scientific way to kind of yeah. get all this. How do you think this should work at UCLA? Yeah, I actually think. Uh... The uh, it's interesting you brought up match. I, I think the matching technology is actually really important. Um, I've been at UCLA for 27 years, and that's given me a lot of opportunity to uh, make connections, find out who does what, who does the research that I'm interested, in, where the collaboration opportunities are. So you know, when you have 27 years to figure that out, uh, you'll you'll get it right. You know, our students, you know, our many of our students are here for only uh, uh, two years. Some of them are only here for 15 months. And, uh, and as, as some of the teams described, if you're going to embark on a project like this, you got to form a team relatively early. So you don't have time to uh, learn the landscape. So I think one of the things that we have to do 
And, and I think this is, by the way, one of the big impediments to doing cross-disciplinary work is we have to make it easy for students and faculty to learn about each other and to match and, uh, and, 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 and be able to sort of form these teams and, 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 and create opportunities that, you know, it might be too late for them to uh, start on if, if we go through the traditional matching process. So when, you know, when I think about, you know, er lots of things being fundamentally cross-disciplinary, I made that statement earlier, then the, nat the natural thing to ask is, well, why don't we see more cross-disciplinary work? If, if everything is fundamentally cross-disciplinary, then why aren't, aren't our organizations organically uh, uh, leading in that direction? I, I believe it's frictions. I believe it's informational frictions. It's about learning what's going on and, and finding matches and finding people um, to collaborate with. And we need, we need to bring down those informational barriers, especially when students are here for a short period of time. Yeah. Would that mean um, practically maybe part of the strategic plan that there'll be more cross registration across campus, yeah. uh, dual degree programs, other things? Dual degree programs, uh, faculty who are embedded in multiple uh, schools uh, because uh, um, they're, they're going to be much more attuned to what's going on. I, I think it's a variety of different things. It, it's not just uh, technology, but it's it's how we organize ourselves. And, and I think this will happen as, as I said, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, fundamentally putting together a curriculum going forward is going to require the expertise across campus. And as we learn more about each other and as students meet with other students in their classes and, and, and so on, all of these different things, I think, will improve the matching technology. Yep. Let me ask you, and this is related to one of the questions coming in too, but the experiential uh, opportunities that students have, whether that's our field study programs or something else, is there going to be a change there that might make them more cross-disciplinary, incentivize more experiential learning, innovation, et cetera? Yeah. So getting back to the question uh, you, you know, we just addressed, which is around bringing down barriers, you know, we have our capstone requirements at Anderson, uh, you know, BCO or AMR or the various capstone requirements. And in order to make that work with students across campus, they have to have capstone requirements that have scheduling that kind of roughly matches. And, mm -hmm. and you know, as schools, we should coordinate to bring down those barriers. Um, there's a huge amount of value, as we can see from these two teams, but from all the teams that participated in this innovation challenge, uh, to having these cross-disciplinary teams. These, you know, what emerges from these diverse teams is, is, is going to be much greater than what would emerge out of a group of just engineers or a group of just students from management or from health or so on. And so I think from a curriculum standpoint, if we could coordinate better across campus, that would bring down another barrier that would make this much easier to do. So yeah. for example, you know, what would be ideal, in fact, we had a student group, the Easton Fellows, who looked into exactly this kind of issue. Uh, you know, how, how can we coordinate with say the School of Engineering so their students could work on a capstone that would have, uh, would count towards their degree with students from Anderson who were doing a capstone that count towards their degree. If you start getting rid of those frictions, then uh, I think this kind of cross-disciplinary work will flourish. Yeah. On that topic, Tony, you know, we're fortunate at UCLA, we have these great schools, you know, in engineering and medical school and business school, et cetera, et cetera. They are, in some respects, their own entities that are very well regarded, et cetera. Are the stars aligned to basically for everybody to say, we all need to be working together more to deal with these bigger issues in the world? Or this is going to take a little bit of time to get the stars aligned across the campus? Yeah. So, you know, another good question to ask is, you know, um, there were probably deans before me who've said many of the same things and uh, why didn't it happen? And, you know, one thing that's true about UCLA, here's a surprising fact that many of you may not know. UCLA only gets 7% of its funding from the state. It, it has to rely much more on its own entrepreneurial activities, innovation, creating uh, uh, new programs, that have value in the market. This was not in our DNA for many, many decades because we relied on heavy amounts of state funding. And generally, uh, you know, uh, there wasn't the necessity. And when there wasn't the necessity, there wasn't the same uh, desire for innovation and so on. The stars are better aligned now because um, 
I think um, there's no way we can maintain excellence um, without being innovative. And the innovations are going to are going to naturally be across uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do think we're in a different context than, uh, you know, uh, what led us to be in a much more siloed world today than we'd want to be. Mm -hmm. Good. Let me ask you now uh, other aspects of kind of changes in the MBA experience, and it's on the how side. We've been talking about the what, which is content related and business and society, et cetera, et cetera. But how the MBA is delivered mm -hmm. online versus not lifelong education, how that might work. Yeah. What are you thinking about the how? So one thing we, uh, one thing we learned for sure in the last 15 months is that we can do some, uh, we, we can do, we can conduct some of our programs quite well remotely. It has limitations for some of the things that we do, but the limitations are small in, in other things that we do. It, it's also highly valued. For example, we have an executive MBA program, a fully employed MBA program. These are students who are currently working and uh, remote learning gives them opportunities at different times of the day that they wouldn't otherwise have. So there's certainly lots of things we can do um, in our, in our, our, our programs um, remotely. We can do a lot of remedial work. We can do work that isn't discussion-based um, and, and, and flip the classroom, so to speak. And the benefit of all of this is better, uh, a lower cost for providing the same quality education. We still give our students the opportunity to network and, and build uh, you know, these peer-to-peer -peer contact opportunities, but they don't necessarily have to be fully intensive for say the two years that they're here. And if you bring down the cost, then you improve access. So I, I do think there's a, um, a spectrum here of possibilities. I don't think UCLA Anderson should ever be fully online. The reason for that is simple. The quality of our students and the quality of our faculty and those interactions are extraordinary. The quality of the opportunities in Los Angeles are extraordinary. This is the, the, you know, the most diverse, most uh, innovative city in the country, one of the most innovative cities in the entire world. To, to, to take students out of that context would be a huge mistake. I might feel very differently if we were situated somewhere else, but certainly not in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're always going to have a significant in-person presence, but we can reduce cost and improve access. So the other thing that we've learned is there's tremendous absolutely tremendous latent demand that we didn't know about among our alums for lifelong learning. Things have happened in the recent past where our students needed, you know, who are in managerial posi leadership positions needed, you know, two day, three day workshops, certificate programs on crisis management. How do you manage a diverse workforce communication in a crisis on and on and on. These are topics that people needed immediate uh, training. Now, think about the old way we would do things. Very limited geographic scope, a lot of cost to bring in enough people to Anderson in person in order to make it worthwhile to put together a program like this. The, the period, you know, the, the, it might take six months, nine months to put together a program like that, but they need that, they need that program in a week or two weeks. Well, remotely, with the geographic scope and the ability to bring in enough uh, people to make it worthwhile, you can do things in a much more timely way. And so I, I really view now the value proposition of being in an MBA program as, as uh, going stretching well beyond the two years that they're here. That was largely, that was also true pre COVID, but now the, 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 the possibilities for uh, continued learning throughout a career are, are tremendous, they're relatively inexpensive, but most important, they can be done in a timely way. That's the part that, you know, if you think about the, the setup cost for doing this in person, sometimes the moment is lost. And, and we learn that pretty dramatically from our alums. There's extraordinary latent uh, demand for these uh, kinds of uh, programs. Mm -hmm. Great. And Tony, let me ask you, any other elements, the strategic planning effort that's going on? I think you've given us a, a glimpse at some of the key elements in terms of thematic areas on business and society, interdisciplinary work, field study activities, et cetera. Anything else that you'd give us a glimpse at that may be a, a future element of the strategic plan? 
Sure. Um, I mean, when you think about, uh, you know, strategic priorities, one of the things you have to think about is where, you know, what, what are your strengths and how do, how do you leverage those capabilities so that you can produce, you know, really distinctive, differentiated uh, programs. And so if you think about what those strengths are for us, I mentioned one already. We're in Los Angeles, extraordinarily diverse, dynamic. There's a growing ecosystem at the intersex, intersection of technology with uh, media, with healthcare, with finance, uh, with education. And we're, we're right in the middle of that. Uh, that's a huge advantage. We're part of UCLA, um, you know, the greatest public university in the country, uh, an extraordinary research university with incredible innovation happening all across campus. That's another, another piece of our sort of core capabilities. We need to leverage that uh, better. We have our, our own at Anderson. We have extraordinary faculty. In some areas, I would say, for example, behavior, behavioral decision-making, uh, finance, um, uh, uh, analytics, we are absolutely elite at the best of the best. So those are another set of capabilities. Then we have a very collaborative and innovative student culture. Uh, it's a wonderful part of, of the school. And so now when you start thinking about, you know, how, how all these pieces might fit together, well, you know, there's obvious, obvious uh, advantages at say the intersection of uh, tech with healthcare, for example. It's got a strong analytics component. We can partner with UCLA Health. All kinds of innovation is needed. It fits very well with our culture. Uh, and it's a growing, uh, a, a growing uh, ecosystem in, in LA. So it, it, it's kind of, it uses our strengths. Uh, you could say the same thing with uh, media and entertainment, uh, which is becoming heavily analytic and so on. So those are the, those are the things that we're looking for. Where, where can we be dis distinct? Um, dif and differentiate, but in order for us to be successful, they would have to build on on our our core strengths, and I think those are those are some of our core strengths. And so I I think the opportunities are incredible. Uh, we you know we we're, we're we we place more students in technology uh, uh, careers uh, on the uh, on the west coast of any school in the country, including Stanford and Berkeley. And um, and then if you think about how technology is transformation, transforming core industries in this region, where we also have deep expertise, I think it's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. So you've uh, painted a fairly uh, good aspirational vision about where to go. You've talked about the assets that we've got broadly. Final question before we do a wrap up, what do you worry about? What could go wrong? How do you make this stuff happen? What keeps you up at night? So um, I, I think um, it's the, 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 the speed at which universities move relative to the speed at which the world is moving around us. Um, we, we have all these incredible assets, but, but a lot of this requires uh, coordination across not just Anderson, which is hard enough, but across other parts of the, of the campus. And, and um we, we're not used to moving at the speed that I think we have to move. Uh, I think we have incredible resources. Um, um, but, um, and, and by the way, some, some parts of the campus are very good at this. They have a, like a long history of this. And so they, uh, they move in a, uh, they, they're much less bureaucratic and so on. But um, uh, I think that's one of the things, uh, I think that's one of the things that, uh, that worries me. Um, yeah. Just making sure that every, everybody, uh, you know, that all across campus, there's the same sense of opportunity, but urgency as well. Yeah, the the competitive strategist in me has to ask this question as a follow up. You know, if we worry about the pace of change, what really matters is us versus our competition. Yeah. Other great business schools. <laughs> So are we hopefully the best of a bad lot and no big worry? Or well, do you worry we're actually slower than some of the others? Well, I, I would actually go outside that a little bit and say our, our competition doesn't necessarily have to be other universities. I mean, uh, if, you, if you think about some of the trends going forward, um, uh, many of these activities can be provided uh, by other institutions. What I think they lack that we have 
is uh, they don't, and this is why I think, you know, the real fundamental value in, you know, as being part of a great place like UCLA is the breadth of abilities and resources that we can bring to bear on a problem. There are a lot of institutions that can do some things well, and I think they can carve into pieces of what we do. But the piece that very few outside in, uh, institutions outside of higher learning can really compete on is when you need to bring in that kind of uh, breadth of, of, of capabilities and resources that you have at a place like this. I mean, the fact that you can just, you know, the, the very best medical researchers in the world are uh, a five minute walk away and the very best legal scholars in the world are another five minute walk away. And, uh, you know, people who, uh, uh, have, you know, our uh, ethicists of, you know, or uh, public policy experts. I mean, the fact that we're all here in one place in less than one square mile. Yeah. No other, no other institution has that. We, that's fundamentally, I think what we have to exploit. Yeah. Well said, Tony, let me try and summarize um, what I heard uh, uh, tonight from you and what a great window into where things are with the school and where we're going. I got several takeaways here. The first message from you is about the intrinsic assets of UCLA that actually started ironically with COVID and your kind of appreciation of our ability to serve the underserved, our ability to utilize UCLA health, but it's a broader view you have about the assets of, uh, of the school. The second main message I got is an importance thematically on business and society. That if we're gonna train the next generation of leaders, there's gotta be a broader aperture uh, a focus we have, not just shareholders, not just customers, but broadly uh, society. And that's going to require, you know, upgrades in the curriculum and how we think about the, the learnings that come out of, uh, out of the school. Third message I got from you is the importance of cross-campus initiatives. This whole idea about interdisciplinary, the world is becoming more interdisciplinary. That's where there's a lot of value. And we need to tap these cross-campus capabilities uh, to really uh, excel. Fourth message I got from you is don't despair. The stars are aligning regarding this demand for everybody to work together on these cross campus uh, efforts. It's a big institution. It has its own kind of pace, et cetera, but the stars are aligning and that's great. Fifth item I got from you is on the how, this whole online capability creates an opportunity for us to reach broader audiences, potentially at lower costs, potentially over a longer time frame, potentially in a more specialized way than we might have had before. And so online is a, is a big opportunity. And then the final message is what keeps you up at night and the challenge is the need to keep working at the pace that the world is changing. And if we can kind of harness the assets we have at UCLA well, we're gonna create one plus one equals three. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of coordination and tenacity, but if we can do that, we will create something much greater than what others can create. Those are the takeaways I got. Um, upgrades you have on that or parting thoughts? No, and um, I, it's a great summary. Um, I. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, what emerged from this innovation challenge is exactly the kinds of activities that I'd love to see more of. I'm so proud of the teams that won, but also the teams that competed, thinking about huge societal issues, really, you know, uh, you know, things that are of first order importance uh, from society and thinking about how, um, uh, you know, we can find solutions to them. And, um, you know, this is, uh, I think, again, fundamentally what we need to be doing more of and anything we can do as an administration to support these kind of activities, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. So thanks for the teams that competed. Thanks, Terry, uh, for your leadership. Um, uh, this is so fundamentally consistent with our mission. And um, not only will Anderson and UCLA benefit, but society will benefit. And that's why we're all here. 
Uh, what Tony well said, and let me let me just wrap up and just first of all, again, just like Tony did, thank our teams because you know they're the representation of everything that we're seeking in terms of technology-based innovation that can serve society. So congratulations again to them. Tony, let me just thank you. Thank you for your time uh, tonight. And even more importantly, just thank you for your support. You are a living example of walking the talk on so many of these things, on business and society, on cross-disciplinary innovation, about working across campus. You know, you're walking the talk and it's it's making a difference at the school. So a big thank you. And we'll look forward to, uh, to more time uh, with you. Thanks again. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us.